is illegal. He said, I will not. Uh, and the governor said, well, you know, this is going to be bad for you. And Lawrence said, I cannot renounce my faith. And then he said, now we understand, Lawrence, that uh, as a deacon, you are responsible for the wealth of the church. Um, would you be willing to, to bring me the wealth of the church? I mean, I, I could command you to do that. And Lawrence said, well, Your Excellency, um, that's going to take me some time because the, the Church of Rome is tremendously wealthy. And now the governor gets all excited and he says, well, how long would it take you? And he says, it would take me, I think, three days in order to collect all the wealth of the church to bring it to you. And so the governor said, all right, you have three days. Do it. The men who are here, they didn't come here because they wanted to live in a holler of West Virginia. They didn't come here because they, they liked the weather. They come here because of a deep, fundamental longing for the spiritual life. Common story is that a man grows up with a pretty normal life and he goes through high school and he dates and he participates in the normal social life in high school and then goes to college or gets a job and everything's pretty normal but the underlying thing that makes him different is that he's not satisfied with any of that when the party's over he's saying there's got to be more than this the world doesn't satisfy them and so he gives up his career he gives up his possessions he gives up his girlfriend and his friends and his money and he enters monastic life and finds that it is sweet. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. This has been a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. Healthy Minds, Healthy Souls, with your hosts, Father Nicholas and Dr. Roxanne Lowe, where we will connect our Orthodox faith to day-to-day -day living in relationship to our family, our work, and our view of ourselves. Father Nicholas is the priest at St. John the Divine Greek Orthodox Church in Jacksonville, and Dr. Roxanne is a licensed clinical psychologist who uses her extensive training in private practice. Your questions are welcome by calling 855-237-2346. That's 855-237-2346. Here now is Father Nicholas and Dr. Roxanne. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining Healthy Minds, Healthy Souls. My name is Father Nicholas Lowe, and I'm joined by my lovely wife, my better half, Dr. Roxanne Lowe, who is a clinical psychologist right here in the city of Jacksonville. As many of you know, in this post-Easter, uh, we have a way of greeting each other. So we greet each other by saying, Christ is risen, and the response is truly, He is risen. So Christ is risen to all of you as we celebrate just the amazing grace that Christ gives us through his resurrection and all that he does for us. And so we just thank Christ for all, everything that he does for us. And we thank him for how he's 
uh, constantly being our lighthouse, our guide in our own walk of faith. So thank you so much for joining us um, this evening. I also want to take this opportunity to just ask you all to do a favor for us, and that is um, we encourage you to join, if you haven't already, to join the Healthy Minds, Healthy Souls uh, Facebook page. You can simply just go to uh, facebook.com and go to Healthy Minds, Healthy Souls and simply connect on that. I also want to invite you to please, if you enjoy today's um, radio show, and I hope that you will, Please, we encourage you to share it with your friends and your family. So definitely make a point to do all that. And finally, I want you to keep Thursday, May 7th at 8 p.m. Uh, free in your schedules to join us on our Facebook page, our Healthy Minds, Healthy Souls Facebook page, as well as the St. John the Divine Greek Orthodox Church Facebook page. We have a special announcement that's going to be going on that um, evening. So we encourage you to all be there May 7th at 8 p.m. So um, tonight, I, I want to encourage you, we're going to be, um, uh, we've gotten many different letters and emails regarding the topic that we're talking about tonight. I know that many of you have called and um, emailed us. And, and in fact, we got one letter that was addressed to us that came from a, 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 a mother named Beth. And she said this, she said, Father mm -hmm. and Dr. Roxanne, I recently to um, was told about your show from a friend of ours, and we love it. We've, we, Although we have recently though lost our job due to the coronavirus, and I'm at home, homeschooling my children. I have such an appreciation now for teachers, and I think so many of us can relate to that. But I'm struggling not only with teaching my children the curriculum, but the stress in our own life with this pandemic, as well as trying to be a parent. Can you do a show on parenting, on parenting towards during the pandemic. And so, uh, Beth, this oh, show is I, I all about why. you. This is a show that we are uh, encouraging um, that through your email and through your letter to us that we have made this show okay. all about that. So um, thank you so much for the email. And we've entitled this show Parenting During the Pandemic. So um, if you're like Beth, this show is for you. And we invite you to join the show by calling in at one 855 Two three seven twenty three forty six. That's one eight five five two three seven twenty three forty six. You can also email us a question at ask at ancientfaith.com. That's ask at ancientfaith.com. Or you can join our chat room uh, just by simply going to ancientfaith.com and clicking on the Healthy Minds, Healthy Souls banner. And I just want to encourage you, all of you, um, if you also have some great parenting tips, if you've had in your own over the last six to eight weeks, if you've just done something that you feel has been very, that would be beneficial to our entire group, please feel free to, to, to share that by calling us or by emailing us or by joining our chat room. So Roxanne, let's give our listeners really what most parents are, are going through right now. And I know that we as a, as a family are also going through this. And so we, it, it's just kind of in, in very basic terms, you know, what is, what is it like being a parent during this pandemic? Oh, gosh, and that's such a big question to answer, isn't it? Nick, we could probably go in so many different directions there. But I mean, I just think first and foremost, there's so much uncertainty that is set in and so many everybody's worlds as they know it have been entirely thrust into a new experience. And, you know, working and staying at home parenting and teaching are usually three different jobs. And right now it feels like they're simultaneously wrapped up into one mm -hmm. and we're all playing multiple roles and you throw in losses, um, worry. So many people are, are just dealing with an, an, an increased state of negative arousal because they're in a constant state of worry and stress about their loved ones, about the people they see on the news. Right. Um, and, and then you pair that with the removal of all of our support networks and the things that used to bring us renewal, like, like church and gatherings with our friends and sporting events. Mm -hmm. We've lost our ordinary schedules. And I think just being completely separated from the normalcy of life, the normal routines we have and the normal roles we are attached to playing it feels like our entire world has been turned upside down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, and just in talking to people, I mean, I, I know during Holy Week, so many people were just, you know, it was so different as a priest. And, and I, I know for, for people as well that, one, it's so bad to be in church, but unfortunately, with the social distancing out of the protection uh, and, and safety of our people, churches were not open. And so just even going through the journey of, of Holy Week and Great Lent and, uh, and, and Pascha and Easter and not being able to really connect to our spiritual hospital, our church, I think that many people were just really going through a very difficult time. And, you know, as I was 
just kind of as we were preparing for today's show, I was just thinking also just the amount of sheer amount of stress that parents are under. I mean, I know for us, you know, we've got two young children and, you know, we don't teach. We, we, we're not we're not teachers. We're not trained, you know, in our teaching and just being able to have to do that while, you know, our, our without having our you know, a, a teacher present um, and having to remember things that we learned back when we were in sixth and seventh and, and eighth grade and just trying to apply that, um, you know, teaching in and of itself and just homeschooling your children now, even with this, you know, virtual through Zoom or whatever system that that your school may be using is totally different. And then you you tack on the fact that, you know, many of our young people, our, our college students, our young adults, they want to be with their friends and their inability to do that. So and, and trying to parent them even during the, you know, and trying to guide them during that whole process has got to be so stressful, you know, on everyone that's involved. And so this show really is about that. It is about trying to give you some just some real practical tools that you can apply in your life as a parent. And um, and listen, we're, we're kind of journeying through this with you. So uh, we don't claim to know all the answers. These are just things that we have tried to apply in our own life and in our own family over the last six to eight weeks. And so please feel free, share your thoughts through the chat room, through um, your, uh, through the uh, calling us in through the, um, at the number one eight five five two three seven twenty three forty six, or even email us um, simply just by going to ask at ancientfaith.com. So, you know, Roxanne, you know, I think because of the, just the sheer amount of uh, desire and intrigue in this topic of parenting during the pandemic, I think it'd be great. Let's just dive right into Let's give some. Let's give some just some practical tools for for parents. I mean, what what would you say is like the number, the number one thing that we think I think that we all need to make sure that we're doing on a day to day basis with our children. So I'd like to start with with number one, and and that is for us to all be seeking to be intentional, um, but being intentional by seeking some small wins. I think um, I've seen people at kind of two ends of the pendulum swing where um, we are overwhelming ourselves with um, major shifts in expectation for what we hope to see happen with ourselves as parents and as kids and as families. Or we have the polar opposite end where people are feeling really overwhelmed and um, chaos ensues and they feel like they have no structure or organization in place and they, they haven't been able to be intentional. And so, you know, really in this number, this first step, I really want to talk about the notion of trying to find that middle ground of seeking some very small steps by being intentional. And if you haven't already, you know, this is where you're beginning to set up and, and communicate some expectations for what you want to see happen um, in your family during this temporary new normal. Uh, we don't know how long it's going to be in place, right? I mean, there, there's so mm -hmm. much uncertainty, but right now it is our temporary new normal. And really, Acknowledging and accepting that this is the way it is right now is the first step to being able to kind of move past it and move forward and resetting some of the expectations we have at home. So, I mean, I'll start out by just kind of talking a little bit about in our own family, you know, after 40 days of quarantine, you know, many of us, including us, you know, have a better idea now of what we needed um, now than we did when we first started. And right. like many of you, we, we were just dealing with the shock of it all, right? And the statistics of what was happening around us were shocking. They were alarming. Um, our hearts were just sinking every day. And our focus was really taking it just one day at a time, doing what was necessary to keep us safe, right? Mm -hmm. If you think about those hierarchy of needs, we were looking at baseline needs of, of, of providing for our physical bodies and keeping us safe. We weren't so concerned with the details of the flow of home life. Mm -hmm. um, it was a good day if we were home and we were healthy and we were all okay. Mm -hmm. So over time, as the newness began to wear off, we began hearing things from our kids like, I'm bored. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing to do. We miss our friends. Why can't we go see our friends? Uh, why can't we go play with the neighbors? The kitchen began to feel like a 24 hour diner. I mean, maybe I'm speaking for myself, but the sink was all of a sudden constantly full, new meals constantly needed to be made. And even the noise, I remember the noise of being on different schedules kind of became a new obstacle to conquer. Our kids were done with school and wanting to play and just let it all hang loose. The dog wanted to follow in suit, yet we're still needing a quiet place to work because we aren't done with our Zoom conferencing, our, you know, my telemedicine and, and Nick, your appointments. Mm -hmm. And so 
what helped us was sort of deciding to set forth some structure here. If this is our new temporary normal, what's going to be different? What needs to be different? And for us, this meant helping our kids kind of create and follow some, some kind of a schedule, some semblance of structure. And now keep in mind, I know that, you know, for some people, they do have a natural inherent preference for schedule. So this isn't for everyone. Um, and we're not, our goal here is not color coded, complicated charts, right? Mm -hmm. That's the pendulum swing too far to the right, but small wins that communicate simple expectations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what those expectations are, are going to be an exercise in thinking about our needs. So here are the takeaways for being intentional. Mm -hmm. Two questions that I really, we want you to think about asking yourselves to create the structure in your home. One, what three things do you want your children or your adolescents, your teens to be doing each day? I love that. When you brought that up earlier in our, and before the show, I thought that was a great, just a great question that we would, that we should always ask is just, well, what are the, what are really truly the, the goals, the things that we would really want them to do every single day or, you know, or within that season, how they approach um, how they live their life, things that we would just want them to accomplish. And these are going to be very different than the three things we might have had them doing during a normal school day exactly. when they were busy in structured activities, running around, um, hardly having enough time for themselves. You know, the demands are a little bit different now, and it's reasonable mm -hmm. to be talking about chores, getting outdoor time, practicing an instrument, scheduling even downtime, mm -hmm. um, and protected boundary and time for homework. Uh, many kids are feeling like they're sitting in front of a computer screen for eight hours. They don't want to be sitting back there doing homework, exactly. right? Um, school's not supposed to take place in the same way, place as homework in the same place as relaxation. It's just all kind of mixed. So what three things do you want your children to be doing each day? Mm -hmm. Okay. The next question I would say is what three things would they like to be doing each day? And it's kind of cute. I think that um, Gabriella's school really wins for this, but they had each child create a project that was going to be making being home during the pandemic just a little more fun. So what did she do for hers? She created these two jars. One jar was going to include all the things that she would like to do, and she had to come up with a whole bunch of new things that she never had to think about during the busyness of the school year. And the other jar simply had times to do everything. And each night she picked from each jar until she came up with a full schedule. And what was neat about it is that every day was a little bit different. Every day were things that she created at the time she picked. Um, and for her, you know, that really provided a sense of safety and security of knowing what to expect next. So she's no longer getting bored. She kind of knows what's coming in her day, which mm -hmm. I didn't realize, but that was such a level of safety for her and security to know what's ahead, what's behind, and what am I supposed to be doing now? And it created some stress in her to not have that. Um, and so she has even discovered that YouTube actually has many instructional videos for do it yourself and mm -hmm. teaching yourself dance. So she's, she's been pretty busy, but again, this is something completely different. And she really had to spend time thinking, what are the things she wanted to do in the day? And by the way, in the, the first jar, there were many things that, that we are asking her to do as well. Um, you know, different chores and things like that. So really be intentional and look for those small wins of how to create a little bit of structure. So I think, you know, to kind of just build on what you were saying too, Roxanne, is I think it's so important that not only do we create some structure, but we also give them the flexibility to create their own schedule within the chaos. Because yes. I think what's so important too, friends, is during this time, there's so much unease. There's so, the the, the storyline is continuously so fluid. Every time we turn on the news, there's, there's more deaths, there's more people that are being impacted. And we'll get to this in a few moments, but our children are feeding off of our worry, whether we communicate that verbally or non-verbally, but they're feeding off of that. So it's important to kind of give them some partnership in the creation of a stable home and their ability to say, hey, okay, look, you think of the things that you want to apply in your day. What are, what are three things that you want to accomplish today? And then we're going to give you three things and let's work together as a team as we journey together through this pandemic. So it's, so number one, I think, as Roxanne was saying, is be intentional by seeking the small wins seeking those small wins that we can win, uh, that we can all uh, create within our family. We've got a caller um, calling us from Las Vegas. Um, Rafi, welcome to Healthy Minds, Healthy Souls. Thanks for taking my call. I um, just wanted to kind of touch on, you know, parenting during this pandemic. Um, we have, uh, my wife and I have three young boys. Our oldest is uh, in kindergarten. Uh, we also have a pre-K aged uh, son, and also our youngest son is, is a year and a half. 
Um, I've been, you know, since this pandemic started, I've been sent home working remotely with the exception of going to the office about once a week. Um, I think, you know, the pros of, you know, parenting during this pandemic is, is been, you know, that we're together. I mean, we're, mm-hmm. we're able to spend more time. We have breakfast and lunch together now. Um, so that's, you know, that's a huge plus, but I think the, you know, the, the, the biggest challenge that we have right now is that, you know, we're not teachers and uh, it's, it's definitely showing now um, just mm-hmm. because, you know, our oldest will have to give him more challenging activities than say, you know, the, 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 the one that's, that's, you know, currently three years old or, you know, mm-hmm. even the baby. And I think that there's, you know, even, you know, there are our oldest, he feels a little jealous that, you know, they have, you know, the younger ones have, you know, uh, I, I guess you would say funner activities and, you know, he's doing more writing and, and math and things of that nature. Um, so it'd be good to, to kind of have, you know, we would like to involve more structure, but um, also have a little bit more uh, individualized plans for each of them, but it's hard when they're all together. And that is such a, such an important point that you bring up because again, the, the, the structures are made so different different by the different um, stages of life and stages of development. Not all kids can be doing the same thing at the same time. Um, And I think that's where it comes down to really sort of deciding what you're going to let go and deciding what you're going to want to pick your battles over and deciphering those priorities, you know, becomes um, a point of intention, right? What, what do we think is most important? And the idea of explaining to kids that different ages require different involvement for different reasons. And so kids have this really big thing on this isn't fair or that's not fair. And I'm, I'm, I'm really big. And, and I think we talk about this a lot, Nick, we're really big on committing. Isn't fair. It's right for your needs. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we parent based on what you need at your stage of development, not based on what's feels fair at the time. And I would acknowledge the difficulty that they're trying to, you know, paint the picture of, you know, they're trying to say, this is stressful, you know, this is hard. And um, I think it's important to sort of make space for that and to communicate that you get it. And we feel it too. Uh, because the whole family is sort of trying to adapt and, and, and become flexible, but you really have to decide what are we going to, what are we going to pick a battle over and what are we not? What are we going to be intentional about? And what are we going to kind of let go of? Mm-hmm. Because you're right, we're not teachers and we can't sit three different kids down at three different ages and expect to, to do a lesson. Mm-hmm. It's just not feasible. It's not humanly possible. Mm-hmm. And really encouraging, you know, uh, Rafi, thank you so much for your call. Um, but just to kind of add to what Roxanne was sharing is, you know, there's no doubt that 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 this that we are living in unprecedented times, and there's and that we as parents, I think, need to share that with our children that we too are navigating this because for the first time too that that, that there has never been a beta or a delta that we can kind of go back and say, well, this is what happened when we were this way, and this is the kind of method that we approach or this is how your grandparents handled it when I went through this situation there isn't a, a baseline of what to, to, to look at and to be quite honest with you there's not we're struggling now really where to, where, the, where there may be even an off-ramp to where we would see an end to this virus and um, and so I think that the key is 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 a owning that owning your kind of um, your feelings about you know how this uncertainty while at the same time though making sure that that you're that you're children or that that you that that you're navigating this together that you're putting your trust in god um but while we're in this situation we're going to make the best of it we're not it doesn't mean that we're gonna we're not gonna um uh, do something uh, as a you know as a response of not doing something else in other words you know we we still need to be doing our prayers we still need to spend time as a family together we still need to make sure that um that we're doing our schoolwork our chores um we're in this and it's i think and you said it beautifully earlier, you're spending a lot more time together. So it's really, I think, very powerful to kind of share this importance that we are a team, like the team is together and we need to be working together and do our part, you know, to um, to help ourselves and to protect ourselves. So great comment, Rafi, and um, thanks again for calling us. And I, I encourage you, friends, um, it, it, to please, Thank if you, you like Rafi, uh, um, who called in from Las Vegas, I just encourage you, if you've got a question or a comment, or maybe you yourself are doing things that you put into place that in your with your own children that you think would be beneficial for all the healthy minds healthy souls listeners listen don't be ashamed don't be shy we we need all the good news that we can get in this world um uh, because there's definitely a lot more uh, bad news that we hear more and more often so share it with us um but if you have questions and comments and i love seeing all of you in the chat room it is packed full of questions and and comments and so we're going to get to those as well but 
feel free to share your questions through our um, chat room or call us at 1-855-237-2346. You can also email us your questions. I know some of you have already done that. We'll try to get to that as well. Um, it looks like this might be a two-part show as it is, So, um, but we're, we're definitely going to try to get to as many of the questions because they are flooding uh, and they're coming in. And um, if you're also joining us through Facebook Live, we just this is a new ministry that Ancient Faith is providing, so you can actually be tuning in to our show now through Facebook Live. So if you're on Facebook Live, we're grateful that you're joining us and we encourage you um, just to keep sharing the radio show with your friends um, and just to kind of spread it around. So Roxanne, if number one is be intentional by seeking the small wins, then, then talk to us about what number two would be. Yeah, absolutely. And I, we're going to jump right into number two. I just wanted to add one thing I thought about um, for our last caller, Rafi, and that is um, that the important with kids because it is hard to witness a different stage of life and to be sitting down doing homework um, and the other kids are, are off playing and to sort of leverage what they have to look forward to. And, um, you know, if you have some sort of really potent system that he, he loves or something he really looks forward to, to really make his learning contingent on uh, receiving that so he has some motivation to get through it when he's watching all the other kids uh, play and to sort of leverage that, the importance of that those small wins is maybe it's like sort of thinking about that structure and that schedule you're putting in place. Well, are we using that time when the other kids are maybe down for a nap or, or on a stroller walk where we can really sit down and have undivided time with one when the others are kind of doing something different. And I think that becomes really important to sort of try to navigate um, the structure and the system we have in place so that we utilize different time for different kids for, for different reasons. Um, but it's, it's tough. I mean, it takes a lot of organization and planning. Um, so thanks for calling that, that, that probably reached, uh, that question probably spoke to so many, um, young families who, who, who are looking to hear about that. Um, so if number one is the intentionality and just looking for the small wins of how to create a little structure, you know, number two is, I think it's just so important. And we, we talk about this a lot, but um, Dr. Gary Chapman talks a lot about the five love languages, right? He's sort of known for that. And if you want to read about him, you can look at fivelovelanguages.com. You can take the test. But the love languages are so important because we are all living on top of each other right now. Um, it's easy to begin scrutinizing behavior. It's easy to become attached to everything you know we don't like. And we are all at our best when our tanks are full. We're all better at following direction when we feel loved, when we feel heard. And if our tanks aren't full, it's pretty easy to unravel. And we, we, we st when we stop loving someone and we stop feeling love, we are much less likely to give the benefit of the doubt in conflict. We're less likely to want to cooperate. And so, you know, when you think about parenting during the pandemic, some of the first things that come to my mind is, do the children in my home and does my spouse feel loved? Because knowing that love language is 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 so important to knowing whether I'm doing something that they are able to receive. Um, so talk about the love languages, right? So what makes people feel loved? Is it affirming words of affection or endearment or praise? Do they like to be encouraged? Do they like to be complimented? Mm -hmm. um, do you have that kid who's always walking in the room going, guess what, mom, you'll never believe what I got on this test. Or guess what? You're never going to believe this awesome essay I wrote. Or look what I was able to build with my Legos. Or, um, you know, you'll never believe what my friend said about me, this dance I put on, mm -hmm. you know, my social media page. That's the kid who's looking for affirmation. Mm -hmm. They're looking for encouragement. Or is it the kid who's, who's acts of service, right? That they feel loved when you are caring for them by providing for them. They are so thankful when you walk in and you help them with their homework, mm -hmm. right? Rather than them trying to spin out and, you know, gosh, I can't figure out in the beginning. I remember George was trying to figure out how do I get this Schoology page to work? My Zoom meeting's not going through. And, you know, how relaxed he felt when we came in and sort of said, okay, let's walk through it. Um, or is it quality time? Does your child feel loved when they are, are they filled by having your focused and undivided attention? Mm -hmm. Is it gifts? Is it touch, right? The kid who really wants that hug. I remember Gabriella told me two weeks ago, she says, you know, mom, I said, what was your favorite moment of this, of this week, Gabriella? And she said, the moment when you came up into my room and you just walked in and gave me a hug and then you left. Mm. She said, you have no idea how alone I felt sitting in my room for eight hours, you know, for school. And so, again, 
her love language is so clearly physical touch and undivided attention. Um, for George, it's so much his, that encouragement, that affirmation. He's a words of uh, praise kind of kid, right? So knowing that is important for your kids, but knowing it for your spouse will indirectly impact your kids because kids do better when parents do better. Kids do better when marriages do better. So again, how important is it for you as you're thinking about the love languages to go, Hey, does my spouse feel loved? Have I given him or her what he or she is needing this week? Mm -hmm. Because if she's tense, my kids are going to feel tense and then I'm going to feel tense. Right? So it is a vicious cycle in a system when our tanks aren't full. Mm -hmm. And you know, we encourage you there, uh, there are obviously a number of different personality tests and marriage tests that, that you can do. And many times I think once, you know, people get married, there's this level of, you know, uh, courting the person, um, obviously prior to them getting engaged or getting married. But then afterwards, we kind of just take a, now that we've got that person, we tend to kind of just take it easy. But it is so important, even irrespective of this coronavirus, for you to just know your spouse. And many of you might be saying, well, we know Father Nick, I know her, I know what she wants, I know how she is. But let me just encourage you, there is a great test that you can go to called, um, that Gary Chapman provides, it's called, the. you can go to it by putting uh, in your uh, search uh, browser, fivelovelanguages.com, and then uh, forward slash, I believe, quizzes. But it simply will allow you to take a test. And I will encourage you, this is one thing that, that Roxanne and I have do every single year because we believe that our love languages do change over time. Um, there, there are things that, you know, when you do have children that are young, as opposed to when you have adolescents or even later on when they're older, it just allows the opportunity uh, for you to know them better because our knee-jerk reaction is to love people the way we think they need to be loved, as opposed to truly what they and how they want to be loved. And in an environment that's so high stress, in an environment where you have stress from work, stress from maybe losing your job, stress from you know uh, not being able to go to church or not being able to see your family um, or, or visit friends or go to the grocery store, you know, or just being able or just the stress of the concern of this health pandemic in your own life or the way it may be impacting other people, you have to recognize that these, all these stresses are like withdrawing or withdrawing deposits from your emotional account. And so because we're, we're sharing this so important with you about knowing the love languages as number two, know the love languages of your family. It's because people are running on empty and you're already seeing, there are already statistics coming out that the amount of stress in marriages is hitting levels that they haven't seen since the um, great economic recession in 2008, 2009. The amount of stress uh, and worry that's going on that and we're seeing divorce rates and divorce increased. rate have increased. Mm -hmm. We're seeing this sometimes at levels during uh, immediately following that of 9-11. So my point being is God yearns for us to love people the way they deserve and what they yearn to be loved. So take out of your shoes a little bit. I know it's kind of hard, but True faith and true love is when you can step out of your shoes and step into someone else's shoes. And let me study. Let me let me determine. Let me find out truly what are those love languages. It's a great exercise to do as a couple. So I encourage you to do so. I hear a lot of those questions, Roxanne, on the on yeah, our chat so room. There's so much in the chat room. I can't keep up with reading. I love all this interaction. I wish we could, maybe we should do a chat room of just going into the chat room and not do a show, but just listen yeah. to the chat room. Let's go to a Alexis. It says. Also, please discuss a little bit about teens and parenting. We have a great kid, but it's normal at this age to be pushing boundaries. It's difficult when she has younger siblings that are not doing this. She is helping her siblings, which is great, but we struggle with the tech usage. And, and I think um, uh, so many people, right. would, uh, we no. see this all throughout the chat mm -hmm. room that maybe that, that may not be, that may be tuning in through Facebook or um, just simply by audio or through our app um, or uh, have been, you know, I can't tell you the chat room is just filled with people saying the amount of tech usage, the, mo the, yeah, amount, the of, amount of tech usage uh, and screen time and screen huge. time is, is, and this really challenges, you know, as parents, everything we've been told before that, you know, limit tech usage. You don't want your kid in front of a screen. It creates stress, releases cortisol in the brain it messes with their, their neurological chemistry. But, but listen, there's some of it that's not preventable right now. And, and here's the other piece of it that many children, though maybe not learning on a screen all day long at school, do unwind by getting on their phones. Well, now 
they're in front of their screen all day long to learn, but they still want to unwind by getting on their phones. Mm -hmm. They haven't really caught up with the new sort of um, pandemic normal. And so they still want to unwind in the same way. And one of the biggest complaints I've heard from almost every adolescent I've spoken to just in my practice is when my parent sees me on my phone, the first thing they do is tell me to get off my phone. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't understand or he doesn't understand. I'm just trying to relax. I've been doing school all day. I'm exhausted. And it's my downtime to scroll through social media and to, you know, text my friends or whatever it is I'm doing. Even I'm looking at needless, um, you know, new shoes on Amazon. It's just my way to relax. And I think kids sort of at this time in this initial stage sort of need that time and space to unwind. And I think it's important for kids to be able to communicate with their parents, hey, this is a scheduled break for me. I, I promise I haven't been doing this for eight hours and I promise not to do it for the next eight hours, but this is a scheduled break. So so again, rather than, you know, let's get off our phones, um, I, I'm I probably would encourage it. Hey, what's going to be your boundary with it? Let's, mm -hmm. let's ask a question before we make the judgment mm -hmm. and sort of let's remember that idea of fall back on flexibility within a structure. Let them call the, let them call the pace, but within the boundary you are setting. Mm -hmm. um, too many kids feel, and also just really interrupted. Teens are also complaining that just because I'm home doesn't mean I have nothing to do, right? So I'm hearing a lot from teenagers that parents are saying, come down and help with this and help with that. And they're like, hey, I, this is a school day for me still. Um, I have a lot that I have to be doing and all the constant interruptions doesn't allow me to concentrate, right? So again, what are the boundaries? What do I need you to do? Let's specify what those chores are and what time you want them done by so that the kids have the flexibility to move within that boundary at a pace that feels comfortable mm -hmm. rather than um, just constantly responding to an, a demand outside of themselves mm -hmm. in their own home. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very stressful. As you can see, it's complex. Um, but um, those are some of the, the tips I would recommend for teens right now. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of continue, I see some comments that, uh, with regards to that uh, on, on, in the chat room. I think the only thing I would add, and, and, and to agree with uh, with both Alexis and Marcy, who are, who are texting and, and, and posting their messages now, is the notion, Roxanne, that 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 doesn't discount the fact that we would still have the same type of um, structure that we would have prior or pre-coronavirus. In other words, you know, not allowing them just to simply go and be able to utilize their cell phones um, in For ways. endless amounts of time. Right, exactly, mm -hmm. that, that, that mm -hmm. you create that structure. And, so, and it kind of goes back to our first point that you're seeking those small wins, but you're also creating a level of structure and boundaries. And that's a conversation that as parents, you need to be on the same page with together with spouse, right. before you're having that conversation with adults. Because so often we, we tend to just kind of have that conversation with the child without really having a unified front. So our children are very smart. They, they know they know they can they can feed off of who's 100 percent on board or who's not. So just right. always make sure that that those bigger topics that you, you've already discussed them with each other, you know what your what your ultimate goal is and then be able to plan accordingly. Right. Those, I love what you just said. I mean, being on the same page, with us, knowing what those expectations are, and then being on the same page with your children. Those same children should know what your expectations are, right? Rather than you don't help enough around the house, what specific expectations you have for them to be helping around the house? They should know, here's a list of the chores we expect you to, to fill in a certain day. Choose one. Mm -hmm. um, and if your chore is done, if you've gotten outdoor time, if you've done your instrument, if you practice your sport, yeah, you can get on your phone. It's, mm -hmm. it's, and it's not as stressful at that time. And that's what I'm big on helping kids to learn to communicate with their parents that, hey, let them know what else you're doing. If you don't communicate and you just get mad and defensive when a parent confronts you, there's no communication happening. We have a judgment, we have a defense, and we have no communication. So it really goes both ways. And I think helping our, our, our kids to articulate is important as well. And I love what Patricia, who's uh, writing us from Anacrates, Washington, and I'm, I'm, I hope I pronounced that correctly, but I love what she was saying. She was just talking that she's a certified parent coach and was just talking about, I love this, that finding balance for each family each day, each week at this time is the journey. And I love that. It's, 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 
It's really just figuring out what works great for you and your family, but also recognizing that um, each family is going to be unique. And uh, what you may see another mom or another family doing uh, and being creative on Facebook that might <laughs> may not work for that you. may not work for you, and, and it may and it may create create an unhealthy you know uh, competition or unhealthy jealousy that, that's on the inside of you. And hey, look, you just run your race. You know your children, um, and we're all in this together and we're all trying to be the best parents because to be quite honest with you this is for for many of us this is the, the we, we we have no nothing to compare it to so um so number two is as roxanne was mentioning earlier is know the love languages of the people that are in your family and i encourage you on your own take some time to take that test with your spouse is a great fun exercise to do so Roxanne, as we're continuing forward, um, I just want to give a, just another reminder to our listeners to please feel free uh, to call us and join the conversation. We've already had several calls and a lot of emails, a lot of emails, a lot of questions, but feel free to do so. 1-855-237-2346. That's 1-855-237-2346. If you're just joining our show, Healthy Minds, Healthy Souls is a show that merges faith and psychology together uh, as a priest and as my wife being a psychologist. This is just the ministry that we want to provide to give you some practical tips in your walk of faith. And tonight we're all about parenting during the pandemic, the, the pandemic, obviously, of the coronavirus. So feel free to do that. And also, once again, want to remind all of you, if you have not joined the Healthy Minds, Healthy Souls Facebook page, do so. Next Thursday, May 7th, Roxanne and I are going to do a special event at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 8 p.m. Eastern Time on May 7th. That's next Thursday. We would love to have you join us that evening. It'll be on Facebook Live. So just please, uh, and also at Ancient Faith as well. So um, just to make sure that you put that in your calendar next Thursday, May, May 7th, 8 p.m. So Roxanne, as we're continuing on with number three. So number three is um, making room for each other's differing experiences, um, whether it's your spouse and the way they're maneuvering through this, whether it's your children, the different stage that your child is at and the differing feelings that even siblings might be having, you know, everyone, I think we have to remember Everyone is moving through this with a different experience, with a different set of feelings, uh, different points of view, different realities, different needs. I mean, look at every senior right now um, graduating. They're in a state of loss and grieving. Um, you know, valedictorians who've worked so hard can't walk across the stage and be acknowledged. Um, kids have missed their senior prom. Um, even kids, you know, graduating from elementary schools or, or the very last year with their friends at one school before they transition to middle school. Everybody's experience is different. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest tips, I think, that if you get out of anything out of this show is to please make room for each person's different experience. We don't want children to grow up emotionally overreactive to their own opinions and feelings because they were not seen or heard as children. And our children every day are learning so much about relationships through their relationship with us as parents, how we treat them is how they will treat themselves and how they will conversely treat other people. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's so important that we teach them to make room for others by our making room for them, by their witnessing one mother making room for the, for their spouse or for the father and vice versa. And as children, if our own reality or point of view is denied, we, because we weren't allowed to express it or because we were told we were wrong for feeling a certain way, or it's not that big of a deal, or there are bigger problems in the world. We tend to grow up either not knowing what we feel, overreacting to what we feel, or denying other people's feelings and realities, right? And so that's because our point of view was denied. So, you know, the idea here that we're trying to communicate is if you notice upset in your child, please make room for it by noticing it, which helps them to see it. Keep in mind that just because they're acting annoyed doesn't mean they realize that they are, doesn't mean they have the tools for articulating it, and doesn't mean they know what to do to solve it. And so they just internalize it. Um, they may say things like, um, I'm just going to my room. Well, space is great, but if you haven't first learned to identify and articulate what just happened and what's, oh, what's wrong, just because that feeling isn't acknowledged doesn't mean it goes away. It just goes down deeper and it impacts them more covertly, right? So ask questions to help them articulate. Don't assume you understand it. Um, I heard it said beautifully once I was, I was listening to somebody and they said, emotions are simply information from our body. They are not good and they are not bad. They just are. Mm -hmm. 
And it's our body trying to tell us something about our circumstance. So you might have kids complaining about what they're experiencing. Good. They're articulating it, validate it, acknowledge it, make room for it. You don't have to have an answer for it. You just have to make space for it and let them know, I get it. You're safe to acknowledge that you're safe to express it. I mean, within the boundaries of being respectful, mm -hmm. um, but there may not be anything we can do from it. And, and, and that's a story for life, isn't it? That we can't fix every feeling that comes in that has arise. Sometimes there's a, a radical acceptance of what we're experiencing that we cannot change. Mm -hmm. um, but through this suffering and through this trial comes great compassion in the future comes great lessons and sometimes even silver linings if we're lucky. Um, and so try to accommodate where possible if you, if you notice your kid is expressing something. Um, and so if you're an investigator as a parent and you want to figure out, you know, how do I make room for their experience? What is their experience? Pay attention. Here's the takeaway. Where do they get frustrated? At what point in the day are they most frustrated? Where do they push back the most and why? And try not to judge them or look through a lens of judgment. You know, even if it's on their phone, just ask questions before making accusations. Try to get them to deepen their um, experience so that they understand it. And more importantly, so that you understand it. Um, so that's kind of making room for your kids. And, uh, you know, I know I've uh, run through that pretty quickly, but I really want to go in another direction here where kids learn to make room for parents and for other people and for their greater communities at large, because making room for each other, you know, good parenting isn't just taking care of every need of your child. It's also teaching your children to look outside themselves and make room for you, for your experiences, mm -hmm. for your fatigue, for your stress. Um, we don't want to be raising children who only think about their own need and cannot um, fit into the world of somebody else's, right? So s spend a little time educating your children about your needs when you're tired. Let them know you need rest or you need help. Um, let them know you can't be in three places at once, even though you want to. Um, let them know what you need as a working parent. What helps you? Um, if Gabriella wants me to look over a report, hey, Wednesday night will work for me. Tuesday night will not. Um, when children can see our needs, they, they're also a little more likely to understand when and why we are asking them to do something. They made space for us in their own mind. Mm -hmm. um, and even about the, the idea of washing your hands or when you go out, wear a mask. Why are we asking them to do that? Is that about our child and protecting our child? I mean, maybe a little, but Nick, I know we talked about this before the show. Let's talk about that. Why are we asking our kids to follow these protocols? Mm -hmm. How are they thinking about the world outside themselves? And I think, you know, to kind of build on what you were saying too, Roxanne, is I think when you're, when we're talking to our children about uh, this pandemic, it's a great opportunity that we're in right now that, that it could be a learning lesson for them about what it means to be a church even within our home, because a church, as we all know, has is has many different ministries. It not only is to take care of the ones that are within the home, but it is also responsible for taking people, care of the people that are outside the home. Um, and so, in that same way, within our home, we talked about number and number two that we're finding the love languages within the family. How do we love each other better and take care of each other and nurture each other? But in number three, though, is also uh, giving us the opportunity to look at and say, all right, when we're telling you to wear your mask when you're going to visit a friend, even though you're doing social distancing and your child is saying, well, we, I don't want to do that. I, I don't like the way it looks. Or uh, we had a, an email up from someone who said the same thing, that, that their child was giving them a hard time because they had to wear their mask. And what we were sharing, what I was sharing before the show is that, you know, wearing your mask is not just about your child's safety. It's about reminding them what Christ says, that no greater love than to lay your life down for someone else. In other words, that you're responsible as Christians, and we as Christians are responsible for each other's health and safety. And let me give you this really like unbelievable uh, um, say that was done by the World Health Organization. So just listen to this for a moment. Um, the average, the, the coronavirus is three times more infectious than the common flu. Let me just say it one more time. The, 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 the coronavirus is three times more infectious than the common flu. So the, according to the World Health Organization, it says that the average person who is infected with the coronavirus can contaminate two to two and a half people um, with just one individual doing that. So if one person with the coronavirus passes it on to, let's say three people, two and a half to three people, and those three people pass it on to three more people, 
for 10 cycles, there will be 59,000 more cases of the coronavirus. All that stimulating for 59, one. 59,000. Right, right. And, and, and many of you might see this already if you tune on, when you tune on the news, and sometimes I think many of us just want to turn it off, and we do, um, but it's like almost every day you're seeing another 10,000, another 10,000, another 20,000, then you're seeing these huge spikes in numbers. And, you know, by God's grace, God willing, you know, we, we are hitting peaks um, where we're on our, the, we, we, we would hope to see these things coming down. And, and obviously there's some talk now in the news about us getting to some semblance of a normal uh, uh, resuming back to what was some level of a normal um, reopening. But with that said, I'm just trying to share with you that something that you would share with your children is that when you're not taking care of yourself, it's not only you putting at risk you and your immediate family, your local home church, but 59,000 other people that God created. And that's something that I think is, you know, what a beautiful way for those kids to think outside themselves and think of themselves in community. Um, and, and that really is our faith in action, isn't it? Our faith made practical that wearing your mask is not about you. Mm -hmm. Yes. It protects our family, but you might also be saving the life of somebody who has a grandparent. Um, when you see those people in a nursing home who are isolated and away from someone, I mean, just think about your role. And, and I've never as a society realized how interrelated we are and interdependent we are on doing the right thing. This is when integrity counts. Mm -hmm. And I just think what a beautiful lesson to share with our kids. This is when it matters. Mm -hmm. This is when it matters. So we've got a great um, uh, a message that's come in through our audio. So uh, a message uh, from John. So uh, uh, I think it's from John. So let's uh, let's listen to that message. Uh, yes. Uh, hello, um, Father Nicholas and Presbyteria um, Roxanne. My name's John Rayner. Uh, I live in uh, Parker, Colorado. Our family attends St. Catherine's Greek Orthodox Church in uh Greenwood Village, Colorado. Uh, I just want to let you know that, you know, we've been going on almost seven weeks now without being able to go to church. And uh, uh, this is it, the longer this goes on, the more difficult it gets. Um, plus, uh, with all the social distancing going on, uh, it's just it's create, created a an extreme amount of tension in our house. Um, especially, we have a 15 year old daughter, and she wants to be out with her friends. But uh, I tell her that you know, well, you need to make sure that you're six feet away, and uh, you know, please make sure that you have your mask on when you go out. But you know, she, she doesn't always do that and she doesn't listen to me. So, uh, uh, it, it just gets really frustrating and, uh, you know, because I'm trying to do the best that we can to protect ourselves from, uh, getting the virus. So, uh, maybe you have some recommendations on, you know, how to deal with that situation and, uh, uh, just, dealing with the increased stress from uh, this whole situation. Uh, thank you so much. God bless you. Uh, thank you, John, for your for your message, your email message. We appreciate that. And, you know, maybe, Roxanne, we can just simply talk about just coping with stress. What are some just some general tools that you would just say in general for parents that are, you know, say the kids have gone to bed and they're they're getting on their couch or maybe they're trying to do their work and, that they weren't able to do during the day and they're just stressed. I mean, they're just feeling a, like overwhelmed. What would you be, what would, what would be some, just some, some input from you as a psychologist to them to kind of just get them to keep on keeping on? Well, you know, I'm a big fan of the question, what do you need? Um, and it sounds so simple. Um, but we can continue to, uh, validate an experience is, is beautiful and validating feelings is beautiful, but you don't want to do it to the extent that you, uh, preclude trying to, t to take back some control in your own life to do something about, uh, owning your own happiness and owning, um, what's going to make you feel better. Um, and so, yes, we all love to be able to jump back into the world that we lived in, 
well, I don't know. I think that world also needed changing too. But mm -hmm. um, the roles that we played and the friends that we miss, um, but what do we need in light of where we're at? What is one or two things that we could be doing to make your stress feel a little bit better? Mm -hmm. um, and it might take some time to articulate that, but I think as parents, sometimes, you know, the answer is, so we're so quick to say no. Um, and sometimes when we um, compromise a little, you know, hey, do you want your friend to come by? You guys sit outside, you know, I'll, you know X marks the spot where you guys are going to, you know, hang in the yard. Um, but I've seen a lot of teens be doing that where parents have said, okay, you know, we can do something in the backyard. We'll put the chairs at a certain distance. You guys can hang by the pool. Um, rather than no, you can't see your friends. Um, so, so trying to kind of lean in a little where you can, how do we get to yes? I guess that's the question I always think in my mind, how do I get to yes? Something that works within my boundaries, the boundaries of safety, but would also, um, in some way acknowledges the need that your teen or, or your family member, your child is struggling with. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that might be some recommendations. Well, and you know, just to kind of, and to add a little bit to what you were sharing, uh, Roxanne is. You know, as a priest, you know, I, I can tell you that I hear so, from so many people about just the stress that they're going through. And we've done several sermons on this topic. So I encourage you, if you're, if you're studying something to encourage you during this time, um, Healthy Souls is our podcast here at Ancient Faith. And we have all of our sermons there. But you can also go to our church's app, um, St. John the Divine Greek Orthodox Church. And uh, in our app, uh, if you're in your app store, you can simply just put that in your search engine. And um, all of our sermons that we've done recently are all on the coronavirus. But I just want to speak to you a little bit on, on how you, when you're going through life, especially in this coronavirus, that number one would be lean on God. And remember that whenever you face stress, there's going to be an internal temptation on your end to want to manage it yourself. Because as humans, we just tend to, we, we kind of go back to this whole fight or flight. Sometimes we will run from that struggle or we try to deal with it. Um, uh, and we deal with it by ruminating or just thinking and, and processing and processing. And, and in many ways, that's what leads to control, uh, an attempt on our part to control. And so I would encourage you that we say this over and over, but it's so important is that is to lean on God. Like if like we are the last people we need to be getting advice from during this pandemic is that we need to listen to God. We need to just simply uh, take the time to just say, God, I'm just going to lean into you. And that and always when in leaning on him, I would encourage you always let God's promises speak louder than the problems we face in this world. So always, and you won't know those promises if you're not spending time with God. In, in other words, you can't have a you can't have a relationship with someone that you're not communicating with. So, although we're having this conversation today, we're on this radio show. At the end of the day, it's it's our encouragement for you that there's a healthy soul that has to come about where you're learning and you're you're spending time with God in prayer, in scriptures, in reading about how throughout history, how our church itself dealt with those crises. Um, so I would say number number one of that was lean on God. And the number two is, and I love, I, I see all these comments coming in. Our chat room is jammed right now, uh, full of people. But it's so beautiful because we are all in this together. So number two on that issue of stress is say lean on God. And then number two would be lean on your friends. Because the reality is that we're all in the same boat. Like, I think that we are all as parents struggling there there you know that we're all trying to figure out and wanting to be the best parents that we can be i think we all yearn to be that especially if you're tuning in you, you're, there's a desire on your part to to be better than you are um, and to learn from others so with that said it's it's making sure that you have the right people in your life that are lifting you up that are encouraging you remember we talk about that as iron sharpens irons so should our friends also sharpen us so um, it's so important to do that and most of our churches have live streaming but they also have bible studies that are live streaming we do here at saint john the divine but i definitely would be part of something that is feeding you more than what the world is feeding you right now so in, in short with the time that we have left I do encourage you to make sure that you are uh, taking the time to, to just lean on God, lean on, the, on your friends, and, and then ultimately to simply say, God, I'm just going to surrender this to you. 
So we have a question uh, in the chat room that I think probably uh, fits a lot of people. Um, and I uh, hear from Tony, I've noticed a lot of unexplained feelings in many of us in our home right now. Even my eight-year-old will sometimes say, I just feel really sad right now and I don't know why. Um, we've got Marcy saying, um, a 13-year-old expressing sadness. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, again, sort of taking hold of feelings and sort of communicating the notion with our kids that, that yes, we all have unexplained feelings. You know, we have them too as parents. Mm -hmm. And um, what a great lesson for life that as you move through life as human beings, we vacillate in one day through so many different emotions. Um, we can go from feeling overwhelmed um, to feeling great, you know, within an hour. Mm -hmm. And the notion that all feelings pass, no feeling ever lasted forever, but Sometimes we can get them to move a little more quickly if we begin actively trying to self-soothe in different ways. Um, I'm a big fan of trying to self-soothe with activities. Um, begin baking something. Um, there's power in just moving the hands and creating something. Uh, maybe you're an artist, maybe you're a cook, maybe you're a knitter, um, you know, but trying to just do something. Sometimes the act of movement in some way, shape or form um, is a powerful mover through of emotion. Um, in and encouraging your kids, hey, let's just get outside and go on a walk. Um, sometimes that helps the feeling move through a little quicker. Let's um, bake something. Let's write a card to somebody. Sometimes that helps. Research has shown actually that our own sadness and our own grief can made, be made better by reaching out to someone else who might be feel, having a rough time as well. Um, and also just soothing ourselves with good self-care, maybe a nice hot bath with some relaxing music for your child, but teaching them the notion that Yes, all feelings are okay. Yes, they all pass. But sometimes we can do just a little bit to help them move through a little quicker so they don't take up residence in our home for longer than we'd like. Exactly. And I'm just looking at some of the other comments, Roxanne, that are coming in on the uh, on the uh, in the chat room. And one in particular was saying that uh, was the question was, is do we have any tips with regards to I've got a um, for parents um, connecting with one another with their kids? We have four kids that are ages three to 14, and it feels like we are parenting 24 seven. I think a lot of us could feel the same way on that <laughs> between the overnight and the early morning needs of the little ones and the late into the evening attention uh, needs of our teens. Normally we leave our kids with grandparents once a month or two, uh, one, uh, once a month or two for a date night, but that's not an option obviously right now. Um, and I think what, what that, you know, what the, uh, this is huge. Yeah. Yes, this is huge. Parents have found, um, that they're really struggling to find, um, separate time for themselves. I had a mom the other day said, is it okay to send our kids to a different room so we can just watch a show together and talk privately? And my absolute 100% answer to that is Yes. Mm -hmm. And even if you have the little ones age three up to age 14, you know, put them in front of their favorite show that they've been looking forward to watching all day. Remind the other kids that are old enough mm -hmm. that you're going to take some time for mom and dad to have time to themselves. Explain it to them. It's important for us um, so that they are basically buying into the, the notion that this is important and they know not to interrupt you. Um, and, and so we, I think we have to take advantage of the times, even young families, you know, I encourage people put the kids in a stroller so that you can just talk and go on a walk. Um, and so the kids are sort of contained and you have that very open space to have real conversations that you might not have been able to have all day, even though you were in shared living space. Um, so get creative, but make it, important. Mm -hmm. Make it important. Let your kids know it's important. Kids are happier when parents are happier. I love that, Roxanne. And uh, just so that all of you know, we are going to do part two of parenting during this pandemic on Tuesday, May 12th. So mark your calendars for Tuesday, May 12th at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. I do want to remind you one last time that on Thursday, May 7th, make sure that you're part of the Saint on the Divine Greek Orthodox Church Facebook page or the Healthy Minds, Healthy Souls Facebook page. We're going to have a special, uh, just a treat for all of you at 8 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be going live, the two of us. You'll see us. And we'll talk with all of you about something very special to us. So we hope that you'll all um, join us. Thank you all so much for your beautiful comments in the chat room, your phone calls. And we encourage and look forward to you uh, being with us all on Tuesday. I'm sorry, on Thursday, May 7th, and on Tuesday, May 12th. God bless you, and have a great night.
This is Ancient Faith Today with Father Tom Soroka, a weekly live call-in show addressing the issues of our day from a distinctly orthodox perspective. You can join the conversation by calling in at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Father Tom is the priest at St. Nicholas Orthodox Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and welcomes guests from across the globe to discuss important topics of interest. Here's Father Tom. Christ is risen. Welcome to Ancient Faith Today. This is Father Tom Soroka, and I'm so glad that you're with us this evening. We'll be taking your calls in a bit at 1-855-AF-RADIO. That's 1-855-237-2346. Bobby will be answering your calls tonight, so please make sure to turn the show volume off before you come on air. You can also join us in the chat room, which is now open, by going to ancientfaith.com slash live. Another way to connect with us is to go to facebook.com slash ancientfaithtoday and place your question in the thread for tonight's show. And finally, you can also send us an email at aft at ancientfaith.com. So let's get started. As a parish priest, it's been both frustrating to be constrained by the limits on our church life by the pandemic, and it's also that we can't gather together physically. We've also been fascinated by the energetic and creative ways that many parishes have kept their faithful Orthodox Christians worshiping, learning, giving, and growing. Orthodoxy is an incarnational faith. We kiss and touch and taste things. But the restrictions and concerns during the pandemic have placed a challenge on that. Orthodoxy is a faith of gathering, but the restrictions on the number of people allowed to gather has constrained us. How have Orthodox priests and parishes adapted and their faithful responded to church life during the pandemic? To help us answer these important, important questions, joining us first are Alexei Krindach, who serves as the National Coordinator for the Second Census of U.S. Orthodox Christian Churches, and he's the former research coordinator for the Assembly of Canonical Bishops of the USA, where he conducted groundbreaking research from 2011 to 2019. To see all of his work, we encourage you to visit orthodoxreality.org. His latest survey is the subject of today's show. That survey is called Coronavirus and U.S. Orthodox Christian Parishes. You can find the link to that survey survey on the AFR and the AFT Facebook pages right now. Alexei, Christ is risen. Welcome. Christ is risen. Thank you, Father Thomas. Very happy to have you here. And also, we have Father Stephen Sichlis of St. Paul Greek Orthodox Church in Irvine, California. Father Stephen is a graduate of Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. He holds a degree from Yale Divinity School, studied patristics under the late Father John Meindorf, and probably the highest praise that I can give him is that he was very good friends with the late Father Thomas Hopko. Father Stephen, welcome to Ancient Faith Today. Christ is risen. Truly he's risen. Thank you, Father Tom. Thank you. Good to be here. I'm, I'm really happy that both of you could join us this evening for this discussion. I think that all of us are learning a lot uh, about the strengths and maybe even the weaknesses of our parishes during this crisis. So in a way, it's, it's kind of a blessing. And I'm looking forward to unpacking the report and picking both of your brains to see where all of this is going and, and what good may come from it. So, Alexei, I'm going to start with you. Give us some background about the survey and why it was conducted and who was surveyed, please. Thank you, Father Thomas. Uh, let me start from saying that this report which we are discussing tonight and uh, which our listeners can find uh, and download for themselves is a very, very preliminary report. So what happened in January, we launched a big national survey of American Orthodox parishes and we asked a lot of questions and we planned to do a follow-up uh, survey 
Turkey in April. Clearly, in January, the subject of coronavirus was not present. But by the time when we were planning to send reminders at the beginning of April, it was absolutely urgent matter. And so what we decided, we basically eliminated a number of questions from original questionnaire. And we included just nine questions, just nine questions in this follow-up uh, survey. So basically, whatever is discussed in current report, whatever we are talking tonight, is based on those just nine questions which were included in this rather long survey of American Orthodox parishes. Now, the good news is that regardless of our current findings, which are quite important, and I'm sure we will talk about them you know, in, in a few minutes, uh, bottom line is we plan to do a follow-up, a rather big study of the impact of coronavirus on American Orthodox parishes, and the survey should be in the field at the very, very, very beginning of the next week. So we hope we have even more data from even more parishes very, very soon. Okay, very good. So, well, let's talk more about the survey itself. Um, right. So so why was this particular survey conducted? Well, uh, like, I, like, I, like I was trying to explain, it felt urgent since we are already in the middle of this big national survey of American Orthodox parishes. And we are getting anecdotal information, you know, from a lot of parishes that church life is totally uh, disturbed. And it's obvious for several reasons, but nobody really has objective pictures. How many churches were able to switch to online services? What type of other problems clergy face? What type of support they need? Do people still meet in small groups? How are religious education classes? What types, you know, further help they need? So it was obvious to, to us that we need this information, not just anecdotally, but from a good sample of parishes so that we can say, okay, it looks like this matter is really important or this trend is really important and share this information with everyone. So see, that's what's the major reason for this survey. Okay, okay, thank you for clarifying that. So Father Stephen, let's go to you. Uh, before we actually begin to unpack the report and we encourage everyone, uh, go to our Facebook pages and you will see the link to the report there. The folks in the chat room, they also have the report right now. So we want you to take a look at that. But Father Stephen, uh, give us your experience on the ground. Uh, what impact has the pandemic had on your parish and on your ministry? Well, I think first and foremost, we've had to move from being a very physical, participatory community to being a virtual community pretty much overnight. Now, fortunately, at St. Paul's, we were able to do this. So we are live streaming services via Facebook and YouTube and our parish website. Um, all meetings have gone basically to Zoom. Um, so last night, we had a Bible study over Zoom. Women's Study Fellowship met over Zoom. Uh, tonight, there's a parish council meeting uh, over Zoom. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, class, Introduction to Orthodox Theology, is meeting over Zoom. So we've had to adapt um, to all of these new technologies, which really uh, we had not used to the extent that we're using them now ever before. Um, I think the other thing is that all sacramental life has been placed on hold. So there are no weddings and no baptisms. Uh, everything needs to be postponed. Everything needs to be rescheduled. Uh, I'm even, we're even rescheduling my own daughter's wedding. Um, so there's no confession during Lent. Um, I mean, there have been times in the past where maybe the last two weeks before Holy Week, I'd be in confession from, I don't know, 10 in the morning to maybe 6 in the evening. Uh, mm. That didn't happen this year. It couldn't happen this year. Uh, no anointing with oil for the healing and forgiveness of Sins. No visitations can be made. Um, I can't visit. I can't visit patients in a hospital. Uh, nursing home ministries have ceased. So orthodoxy is this very tangible, very physical, uh, very incarnational, as you said, Father Tal, very sacramental ministry, and that that physicality has been eliminated in going online. So that's that's really a huge problem from my point of view. I think the other sure. problem that will emerge pretty quickly. Um, will be financial. Um, I think that 
uh, and we'll see because we're still early in this uh, in terms of looking at certainly our parish finances. But I'm sure during Holy Week, um, giving was down. And so I think that's also an issue for all churches, uh, not just simply Orthodox sure. churches. So those are the two right. sort of main things, I think. So let me follow up to that, Father Stephen, and, and just ask you, have you been getting any feedback from parishioners specifically to say, I'm, I'm really liking this or I, I'm not liking this at all? What, what's the reaction by your parishioners in terms of let's, uh, let, let's, let's leave the easy stuff out with the classes and so forth. I think people can figure that out. They do it often at work, but specifically the liturgical aspect. How are people uh, responding to that part of it? I think at least the people that are talking to me are kind of devastated by this. Um, people are hungry to go back to church. People want church. Um, and I think that you know, I, I'm already talking with the parish council and with other people and saying, boy, and I know it's going to be a gradual coming back to church, but when we could all come back to church, I want it to be a celebration just like Easter. Uh, so my experience mm. has been, certainly at a pastoral level, that uh, people really miss coming to church for Holy Week. People really miss being in church on Sunday, and they want to come back. Um, everybody's very grateful that we're able to to live stream the services. Uh, but people are saying to me, uh, I miss the smell of incense. I miss being able to kiss the icons in the church. I miss, I miss, uh, they miss basically the physicality of the church and, and also our communion as a community. Um, you know, they, they miss obviously communion in the body and blood of Jesus, but they also miss one another. And, and that's one of the great things about St. Paul's is that I really feel we have a community of people who actually do love each other and miss each other mm. and think of themselves as kind of a large family, an extended family. Right. Wonderful. one af radio That's one 237 2346 Tonight's a wonderful opportunity uh, to for priests especially. I would say if you're a priest and you want to share your experience, please call in. We'd love to hear from you. Have you done something that was uh, that really worked very well? Have you done something that maybe spectacularly failed? Let us know. We'd love to hear about that. And from the laity, we would love to hear from you. one af radio What are your feelings about this? Are you anxious to get back? Are you uh, are you kind of uh, 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 worried about what it will be like when when you get back? Tell us your feelings about that. I we would love to hear from you. Okay, Alexei, let's let's walk through the results of the survey question by question. And Father Stephen, I'm going to ask you uh, as we go through this to um, you know to to give your perspectives on this. We don't have a lot of time to go through every question, but. Again, we're encouraging everybody to download that that uh, report, to take a look at it. And the first question, uh, Alexei, is if you look at the beginning of it, it, it's really just talking about the characteristics of the Orthodox parishes participating in the study. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, what you found there before we get into the questions. Yeah, right. Uh, first of all, let me say before I go to data that Remarkably, most of what uh, Father Stephen was talking about, we actually now got the data in this report. And so uh, report was exactly on all those aspects that Father Stephen has mentioned, except sacramental life. We plan to do this more in the follow-up study. So we have those data, and Father Stephen provided unique example of his parish, but we have this nationwide. So uh, basically, the type of parishes which participated in our study, we have quite a big diversity. Uh, we have representation of eight parishes from eight different jurisdictions, with majority of them logically representing Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, Antiochian Archdiocese, and Orthodox Church in America. So then uh, we have parishes where uh, basically 80% of members were United States born, 
five uh, percent of members uh, were recent immigrants from the United States. About fifty percent were converts to Orthodox. Uh, about fifty percent of members live within fifteen minutes of their churches, and I will turn later to this aspect. It's very important. But because I have my data basically statistically nationwide on the same aspect, so basically what we got in our sample is fairly close to the same statistical breakdowns nationwide. Also, our sample was relatively small. So I do believe that our small sample was fairly representative as much as it's possible with small sample of your typical average American parish. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you that. Did did yeah. this uh, slice of the uh, Orthodox United States Orthodox uh, 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 population match prior studies that you've done of much larger studies? So you're saying the, uh, that, that's pretty close. Yeah. The answer is yes, it does. I still there is still a note made at the beginning of the report that the sample is relatively small. Take those conclusions as being preliminary. We have follow up with bigger national report, but so far, all demographic data on the parishes which we got in this relatively small sample are matching uh, demographic data of U.S. parishes nationwide. Father Stephen, uh, since we're on this idea of the characteristics of the parishes that participated in the survey, tell us a little bit about your parish. What is the, the parish makeup there? Well, the parish makeup is that we really, in many ways, are a pan Orthodox parish. I mean, we have people of Greek background, Romanian, Russian, uh, you know, Arab background. Many people are converts. Uh, we are a real mixture, a real slice sort of of the American pie, so to speak. Uh, our common language for worship is English. Um, we will do Christ is Risen in maybe five different languages, uh, Greek and Russian and Romanian, Arabic and English. Um, wow. So, again, it's, um, uh, it's a very dynamic community. It really is. Um, and again, made up of people from all walks of life and all ethnic wonderful. backgrounds. Wonderful, wonderful. So, Alexei, let's go to the, the second part of the report, and that is adjusting liturgical services right. and small group ministries to new circumstances. Right. What did you find right. there? So, we found there was one, and what I wanted to say, remember, our data are bound to the week of April 6, April 13, which means it was still relatively early time mm. when parishes had limited time to adjust to new circumstances. I am sure if we will run survey today or in one week, the figures would be slightly different. But again, we were just point. at the beginning. Yeah, I, I just wanted to... Uh, to make this provision. Now, the message was, remember Father Stephen mentioned when he talked about his parish that they were able quickly to switch to streaming uh, online services, but also they were able to pretty much revive their small group ministries, religious education classes, now they meet via Zoom, etc., etc. And here is what statistics tells us about nationwide situation during the April, the week of April 6 to 13. By that time, remarkably, most of the parishes managed to switch rather quickly to online streaming. Uh, online streaming. So in our sample, when we ask, which best describes your current situation with worship services? And we give people four options to respond. The first option was, we posted online recording of services or live stream to our services prior to coronavirus pandemic. So we continue to do so. They were already prepared those right, parts. Right. But in our sample, there were only 14%, one four. It's, you know, like one in eight parishes or one in seven parishes were prepared to coronavirus, technically speaking. But then 47% of parishes, almost half, said because of the pandemic we began live streaming services or recording and posting them online so bottom line is very simple by 6th of april more than half 61 percent of our parishes were not only conducting services behind the closed doors with small groups of people present the servers but they were able to actually go to their parishioners and I'm sure that now this figure will be higher than 61%. But again, bear in mind, 
almost half of American parishes were able to switch to online services and stream their online services fairly quickly. Now, the second point in Father Stephen's short uh, discussion about his parish was that, okay, we also are good with our, you know, online meetings uh, for religious education classes. But this was not the case of most of the parishes. So while most of the parishes were able sure. to, to go online with their services, in case of small groups ministries, situation was quite opposite. So long story short, again, during the week of April 6th, 13th, in most of parishes, uh, religious group, uh, small group ministries and religious education classes were pretty much dead. Only 38% of the parishes reported that they managed to establish some sort of online classes and online meetings. So there was a good news about quick switching online worship services, but rather bad news about the fact that in most of parishes, religious education, small group ministries are dead. Yeah, so April it, it seems very... Yeah. It seems very counterintuitive to me um, that, um, you know, the, the, the easier part of this, although maybe when you're dealing with children, the, the reality of it is, um, you know, it's a little bit more difficult to get kids involved in Zoom in a classroom situation. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, of training itself, it seems like uh, that would have been a little bit easier or, or, or some kind of Christian education. So you know, that came actually, as a surprise to me. You know, actually, I think I have explanation for this. And mm -hmm. this is not direct explanation. This is indirect explanation. Because in one of the questions, in one of those nine questions, we actually asked clergy, uh, what are your major challenges to offering online worship services? So now we are talking about online worship services. And yet, most of clergy said, well, the major trouble is uh, is involving members who are not digitally connected or computer savvy. <laughs> right. Now, watching online right, services right. requires very little effort. You just go to your laptop and play the watch. But if you yeah. wanted to connect and to participate in Zoom, you require even higher level of technical skill. Mm -hmm. So my sense is, but again, we will, we will research it better, that with all those online meetings for religious education classes or small group ministries, you need more proficiency on the side of your parishioners uh, rather than on the side of the central office of the church. When they watch online yeah. services, it's just, you know, passive. You go, you put your link, right, you don't right, do anything. Right. 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 So I think that, that's it, that explains. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a very good explanation. Father Stephen, did you find that um, it was the older members that really weren't able to kind of understand the idea that there were these services online or they were being streamed or Zoomed or, or whatever you did? Um, did? Did the older members get that or did they understand that or did they feel a little bit disconnected from that? Well, I think we made it as easy and as simple as possible to go online. So anybody uh, of any age could get online and see the services really, really easy. Uh, Zoom is very easy to use as well. Now, I do have some parishioners, for example, who do not have even a computer and were missing out on some of the services. And actually, this one lady, um, I have a gentleman in the church who's part of the staff of the church. He had an extra iPad. And, and he called her, and, and uh, she came by the church. They're all dressed in their uh, PPE, their, <laughs> uh, their masks and their gloves and everything else, and he showed her how to watch the services, and she was wow. absolutely thrilled. Now, the That's other great. thing that we're doing is that there are some people, obviously, uh, who may not know how to use a computer, but they certainly know how to use a telephone. Uh, so on Thursday evenings, we have a call-in Bible study. Uh, that oh, actually it's on the first letter of John, so that people who uh, maybe can't use a computer or don't have a computer even who are older uh, can just simply call in. Uh, I think not having classes online now is um, a spiritual disaster. Uh, we need to have that. Um, and people need to see each other's faces, even if it's just sure. over Zoom, um, mm -hmm. to maintain at least some kind of minimal uh, connection but also to yes. keep teaching them their faith. 
Very good. Very good. Alexei, real, I want you to answer this real quickly for me. Uh, Janet in the uh, chat room asked, does the survey, this is back to the church services, does the survey include those whose church continued to meet, that is, didn't close? Because I didn't see that in there either. Yeah, yeah. So in our sample, we offered this opportunity uh, to say that uh, we, we continue, I mean, we offered opportunity to say we conduct services in the church, but only clergy, possibly servers and uh, choir chanters are present. And we had like 31% of those churches, but no parishioners. I do know that there are parishes which continue to meet. I talked with some priest from uh, Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia in Florida, for example. But there were no such parishes in our sample. There were no parishes which said, okay, we continue to meet not just clergy and chanters or choir members, but also parishioners. We didn't have such parishes in our sample. Okay. Very good. Uh, we have a call, gentlemen. So let's talk to Paul from Indiana. Paul, welcome to Ancient Faith Today. Christ is risen. Truly is risen. Thank you, Father. Uh, what is your question? Uh, so my question is, I know that many of our uh, traditions in orthodoxy are very physical, uh, but especially, say, kissing the icons, kissing the cross, kissing the priest's hand. And one of my concerns is that it's understandable to give those up during a pandemic, but for millennia it hasn't been a problem. My concern is people will be afraid to go back to those traditions. Is there any sign that that might happen? That's a great question. Um, I know we're going to talk at the end about you know what the future looks like, but uh, Father Stephen, let's start with you. What's your sense of, let, let's start with this first. Let's answer Paul's question of, have you modified? So the people that do come in church, I was looking at some of your streaming services and you had the chanters in there and some of the altar service and so forth. Are they venerating icons or are they modifying that, first of all? Um, they're modifying that. Those are the instructions of Archbishop Alpidophoros uh, and my own bishop, at Juan Erasmus. Uh, and also, as you may know, um, the Standing Conference of Canonical Orthodox Bishops came out with some guidelines that say pretty much the same thing. So um, before we completely shut down, uh, some guidelines were issued in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese saying that we should not uh, kiss icons, uh, take the liturgical booklets out of the pews, uh, not kiss the priest's hand, uh, do some social distancing, and so forth and so on. So the week before uh, everything shut down, we had already begun initiating steps uh, to deal with the transmission of the disease. Um, so when we come back, um, I think uh, certainly I'm in California, and so I think certainly in California, uh, Governor Newsom will do things on a graduated basis, I guess I'd say. Um, I don't know if you know this, but the Church of Greece, uh, the prime minister announced today that uh, May 4th, uh, the churches will open again, but just for private prayer. Uh, people can go to church, light a candle or what have you, but not gather for the Eucharist yet, not gather for services yet. But then gradually over the next two or three weeks in May, uh, they'll be allowed, if things don't get worse in Greece, uh, to meet again as church, as, as a community, uh, a Eucharistic community. So we'll have to see how that goes, first of all. But secondly, um, will people lose those traditions? Um, I honestly don't believe so. And, and if I thought they did, I'd be telling them they got to start doing that stuff again. Um, it's not, I don't think they're going to lose those traditions. Those are too ingrained in orthodoxy, I think, for people to lose. Does that make sense? Right. Paul, what do you think? You think they'll, they'll it, it's so ingrained in orthodoxy that uh, they're, it, it won't be lost, it will come back. I'm honestly not Paul sure. Paul from Indiana, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Can you hear me? Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm, not yes. sure. I'm not sure about that. Um, 
those traditions, for example, uh, were ingrained in Roman Catholicism, though one might say that they more Mm -hmm. consciously dropped those sorts of things. But I think especially uh, in the U.S., uh, you know, outside traditional Orthodox countries, uh, we don't have a touchy-feely culture around religion as we do with a, a Protestant mainstream that I, you know, I'm worried that there are people who would have been, you know, honestly, I mean, I'm disgusted by the idea of, you know, kissing and stuff who have been, would have thought that they would have wanted this to happen anyway. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, first yeah, of all, I, I, think, I don't think uh, that orthodoxy those... is Catholicism. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Father, please. Forgive well, me. I, th- no, I, I think what, I think what Paul is saying is that Americans, so let's just take, you know, in, in some parishes, you might have 70, 80, 90% converts, and they have not had that um, lifetime of, you know, uh, uh, the ability to kiss icons as a, as a really a, a second nature to us. So in your case, you grew up as Orthodox. Alexei grew up as Orthodox. I grew up as Orthodox. You know, we have Orthodoxy for generations. But there may be some people that are so affected by this, uh, the, the social part of the pandemic and the hyper- uh, sterilization of everything that it will eventually uh, change the their attitude toward the veneration of icons and the veneration of holy things so that they may no longer feel comfortable with it. I think that's probably a possibility with with maybe a small portion of people. Unfortunately. If I can if, if I can jump just for a second. Yeah, uh, please. Sure. Uh, we did not we did not ask exactly this question in this survey, but we will ask those type of questions in the next one. But here is a few things. Uh, number one, uh, when you mentioned converts, actually I believe that uh, all my previous data suggests that those people who convert to orthodoxy they actually embrace all aspects of orthodox liturgical and sacramental life to the fullest. So in fact, I believe that the the last folks who will <laughs> decline this tradition of venerating and teaching icons would be actually converts. That's my belief. Uh, we can look at, at, at the survey. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Oh, those people go all, all the way it. through. Yeah. The second is, sure. in our current survey, we ask mostly questions like, you know, check marks, check box, check box, but then we offer people just to write whatever they think is important to write about their experiences. And what I'm getting, everything depends on a very, very particular context of a local parish. In fact, some clergy complained that they are lost between guidelines which they are getting from secular authorities locally and guidelines which are sent by their bishops because, you know, we have big dioceses which cover several states. And then they will tell a story and it is obvious that in certain parishes, people are still eager to go for this physical contact and they believe it is safe and they don't mind, whereas in other parishes, people are rather reluctant. So a lot depends really on a local parish context. And then the short one, interesting moment. I'm sure that parishes will find some innovative way of adapting to new circumstances, yet keeping our orthodox tradition. Let me give an example. I talk to my colleagues who do similar studies for other Christian denominations. Look, in one high-end Episcopal church, they established a five time window slots of time when people can literally drive through the church, get their holy communion in exactly those five minute slot time, which which is given to a particular family and drive back home. This is just this idea that, you know, you always can find something how to keep tradition, but in a new pocket, so to speak. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Yeah. Uh, th- there was one more comment. Uh, there was an, a caller that called in, but they just left the comment. And, and so I'm going to read that. And basically, it was saying that their parish is not following the rules of the state. In other words, if the parish is saying, if the state is saying, you know, you, c- you can only have 10 people or you can only have five people or, or whatever it is, that parish is not following the rules of the state. But 
this parishioner feels he really shouldn't go to church because he doesn't want to get infected. So, Father Stephen, what would you say to someone like that? Well, I mean, that's pretty much of an abstraction in a certain sense because uh, states do vary at this point. Um, different bishops vary, uh, at least in some things, at least. Uh, but I would say that, uh, at least in the Greek Orthodox Church and the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, uh, we have been told to be closed down. And so a priest, in order to be responsible, uh, does need to be closed down. In other words, um, we do not want, uh, as communities, to be responsible for uh, not only the infection of our own people, but the infection of people outside our communities. Um, and uh, that's, I mean, I would say that we're closing our churches. Uh, someone said to me, well, we're closing our churches out of fear. I don't really think that at all. I think we're closing our churches out of love for one another and out of love for the greater community good. Um, I don't, um, so if his priest is doing that, I think that's a mistake. But as far as he's concerned, uh, if he doesn't feel comfortable going to church, um, I, I think there's probably good reason to feel uncomfortable. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, again, uh, the, the issue here is not, um, someone said to me, are we afraid that communion transmits the virus? We don't feel that communion, we don't believe that communion, because it's the body and blood of Jesus, can transmit the virus. However, we get close mm -hmm. to each other in church. And, and that's where the virus is transmitted, in our proximity to one another. Right. So that's really the issue. Right. And so if he does not feel comfortable coming to church because it's too crowded, well, that's understandable. Absolutely. Very good. one eight five five af radio That's one eight five five two three seven two three four six. We'd love to hear from you. Please call in. Tell us what you're doing. Lady, tell us uh, how it's going uh, being on the uh, outside uh, of your parishes and hungering to go back in. We are going to take a quick break. We are going to come right back with our two guests. We're talking about the survey of the coronavirus and how it's affected U.S. parishes. We'll be back in 90 seconds. Father Tom will be back in a moment. In the meantime, the lines are open at 855-237-2346. Don't go away. Hi, this is John Maddox. In the midst of the worldwide concern over the COVID-19 virus, Ancient Faith Radio is committed to being a valued resource for you and your family. If you haven't browsed our website recently, I encourage you to take a look. A rapidly growing number of podcasts and live shows have addressed the topic of the virus from a wide variety of perspectives. Interviews with medical experts, reflections on our spiritual response, theological discussions about God's role in the pandemic, resources for talking with your kids, and much more. We've been here for you in the past, and we'll continue to be here for you in these uncertain times. What is certain is reflected in the prayer often attributed to Metropolitan Philaret of Moscow. Teach me to treat all that comes to me throughout the day with peace of soul and with the firm conviction that your will governs all. Stay safe and healthy and share these online resources with your friends and family. And as always, thank you for your support that makes all of this possible. We're back with Ancient Faith Today and Father Tom Soroka. Give us a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Father Tom. We are back talking about the coronavirus and the U.S. Orthodox Christian Parishes survey. We also had a comment on Facebook Live. By the way, we are now streaming our show, Facebook Live, and we're streaming it on YouTube, so check that out. It's really cool. Thank you to AFR for doing that. That's really been very wonderful. And it says, my teen boy, age 17, is in the altar every Sunday, mainly because he cannot sit through church, and he loves the camaraderie. 
So the online is not something he or my daughter, age 20, who is usually in the choir loft, are willing or able to sit through. I do sit and watch, but the participation, even for me, is lacking. It's heart-wrenching, really. So, Father Stephen, um, give us a little feedback about Karen's comment there that the online streaming service is really not doing it for her. She's finding it very hard to be engaged. Her kids are totally not interested. What can you say to help her encourage her? Well, I think several things, I, I hope. I mean, one is that even if you're at home, uh, you need to set up that uh, worship time as a sacred time and as a sacred space. So, for example, for us, during Holy Week, um, I know that our choir director distributed the music of Holy Week uh, to all the choir members. Uh, she is one of the main chanters of the parish, and when she's chanting, uh, she encouraged the choir in their homes uh, to sing along with her and encourage the choir members to teach their families basically how to sing along. Uh, Pascha night, when we're doing the services, everybody, the lights are out. Um, when I come out and say, come receive the light from the light uh, that's never overtaken by night, um, you know, light your candles at home. Um, we had our kids in, 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 in homes uh, building little kuvuklia, uh, little tombs of Christ, and, and placing the icon mm -hmm. of Christ that they had colored. And then, I mean, we had one family where, uh, for sure, I mean, more than that, actually, where they went around their home in procession with their little homemade kuvuklia um, with, I saw their, that. with their yeah. daughters. Um, so I had sent out emails uh, talking to uh, the problems of, how to participate in Holy Week from home. Uh, we even, uh, in, at St. Paul's, I do the service for the washing of the feet uh, on Holy Thursday. So uh, I know of two families uh, who actually wash their own children's feet uh, in imitation of that service that day, uh, even though I could not do it in the church because I could not have 12 people there and wash their feet. So... Um, so what we've been trying to do at St. Paul's is teach people to treat that time uh, on Sunday or, or any of the other services as a holy time. Um, and we're trying to teach people to treat even the quarantine uh, as a kind of extended Sabbath in some ways, that, that this mm. can be a time. Uh, I mean, quarantine itself, I mean, it's an old Latin word that means 40 um, it, it actually in Venice in the Middle Ages, uh, if you if a, a ship showed up in Venice from an infected area in a plague, they had to remain in port 40 days with no one getting off the boat, um, and that's really kind of what Lent is in some ways. And um, you know, so that whole 40-day symbolism I tried to teach people, um, and then the other thing is that this is a time where we can. Uh, really make the services our own, uh, even in our homes with our children. Uh, so, for example, when it's time to kneel, I mean, right now we're not kneeling, but during Holy Week, you know, when it's time to kneel during liturgy or any of the services, mm -hmm. kneel. Mm -hmm. um, when we would kiss the cross, as we normally would on Holy Thursday evening, the cross that we place in the center of the church, take one of the crosses sure. from your home and kiss it there. While, you know, while we're doing that in church. Um, so, so we have to understand that our liturgical worship this year needs to be transferred to our homes. And it's not mm -hmm. something just that the clergy do for you, but that you actually have to do it yourself. And in that sense, it, it's, I, I'd say it's almost a revival of, uh, God forbid I should use this term, the priesthood of all believers, uh, that that our laity need to have some consciousness of their own role and identity as priests uh, because of their baptism and their chrismation. Yeah, that's great. It takes a little time to prepare, to have an appropriate place to 
uh, to have this uh, this time of worship, and it's going to look different. I've seen some pictures on the internet where people were putting their computer in their icon corner so that they could pray yes. in the place that they always pray, but then follow the services too. I thought that was wonderful. Alexei, this brings up a, a, a question here, and that is the survey that you did. This was only for clergy, correct? Correct. That's right. So will will there be any opportunity to follow up with lay people to ask them questions like, how did this work for you? What did you prefer? What did your parish do? Will you be planning anything like that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, first of all, we do think about how to make it happen because uh, we perfectly realize that clergy provide a very good insight but it's their perspective, and you cannot really ask clergy what exactly their parishioners feel. They can guess, but they really you know, don't know exactly. So the the short answer is yes, we are trying to make it happen. The major challenge is how to get a good sample of respondents. If you just tell, well, you know, we have posted, you know, survey online and ask whoever wants to participate, it's not exactly a good sample. So my thinking is, uh, side by side with survey of clergy, to ask clergy in the parishes where we will send links to the survey for them to send them another link and say, okay, Father, this is link for questionnaire to your parishioners. Please send it along your email list, whoever will participate. So much depends on the willingness of clergy to help us to reach out to individual parishioners because I don't have database on email addresses, you know, for thousands of lay people in the United States. Sure. So it depends. It depends on the willingness of parish clergy to help us and to further distribute links to questionnaires so that their people in the pews can complete the surveys. Uh, I have interesting comment. Just backtracking for a second to the previous uh, caller who mentioned that. Uh, his son wants to go to the church because it's very participatory. We have interesting piece of data in our current survey. And listen, that's that's really quite something which came to me as a great surprise. I was really, really, really surprised. Great. So one of the one of Let's the questions was yeah, one of the question was, and we asked clergy, that's the question which you how strong is the need for following resources and help for you as a parish priest in the times of pandemic? And then we gave them a long list of different aspects, like I need help on how to maximize online giving, I need help with technology, I need better resources about coronavirus. So this list was like 15 items. To my greatest surprise, by far the biggest proportion of clergy, by five, by far the greatest percentage of clergy, more than 60% said we desperately need help in finding ways to remotely offer spiritual support and nourishment to individual parishions. In other words, talking over the phone mm. doesn't work. Uh, talking via internet doesn't mm. work. If people have troubles, they really wanted to talk with priest face to face. This is sort of like gives you idea that really our uh, our orthodox space is very, very, so to speak, laying on hands, literally. So. I'm sure it will be a big concern for many people, not just to have possibility to watch online services, but at least once in a while to be surrounded by fellow parishioners or talk face to face with priests. So I'm sure it's a big issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's let's go through that particular section. That's um, question four, right? What help is needed by parish clergy? during the coronavirus pandemic. So you said that the you know the, the the biggest need was finding ways to remotely offer spiritual support and nourishment to indi individual parishioners. Tell us a few other things that are in that uh, particular uh, question that you found that parish priests needed. Sure. So let me first read exactly how question was worded. How strong is the need for following resources for you as a parish priest in these times of the coronavirus pandemic. 
So, uh, and possibilities to respond were extreme need, strong need, moderate need, not much need. So when you lump together first two answers, extreme need and strong need, like I said, on top of everything was, I need to find ways to remotely offer spiritual support and nourishment to individual parishioners. But then three other items have gotten more than 40% of clergy saying we feel extreme need or strong need for support in these areas. Uh, one was quite logical, support in developing and posting online or live streaming services. About 46% uh, of clergy say that they need support. Now, among those clergy were already people who streamed their services, but they still feel like they can improve it, and so they need more support. That was item number two. Item number three, we need tips on surviving financial crunch. And we got also some data which tell exactly what is going on with finances. We can discuss it later. But item number four was again quite interesting. I need help with setting up and fostering so social media conversations among all parish members. In other words, it is not just two-way communication, priest and individual parishioners. So clergy are concerned to keep conversation going among parishioners, not just not just making available to them worship services or not just offering them religious education classes. That's two-way channels. The clergy were seriously concerned to keep social life and fellowship life of parish going, and they didn't know exactly how to organize these interactions, how to foster it, how to encourage people to talk to each other, to discuss church matter, et cetera, et cetera. So those yeah, were yeah. concerns. Sure. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, Father Stephen, there was another, uh, another question or comment that came up on Facebook, and it's from Harriet, and she says, we don't believe the communion uh, transmits disease. She's, she's saying what you said before. However... <laughs> The archbishop said that the spoon is metal and some may not want to take communion the traditional way. If we do change, uh, this is her question now, how will receive, how will, how we receive communion, if we change, sorry, if we do change how we receive communion, what will that look like? So uh, the, the question here is, uh, and I know every parish is different, every diocese is different. First of all, in in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, was there any um, question or allowance for different ways to give the Eucharist? Um, not really. Um, you know, I, honestly, that's a question that's above my pay grade in many ways. Um, but I guess what I'd say <laughs> is that I know that the um, Russian Orthodox Church, uh, for a little while, uh, before they were actually decided to close down, um, they were administering communion and then uh, wiping the spoon with the cloth with alcohol uh, after each yep. giving of communion. Um, I know that they were no longer drinking wine and water from the same cup and so forth, but each person was given uh, yeah. after they received communion individual good. cups, uh, you know. So, um, uh, but again, as far as the Greek Orthodox Church goes, as far as the Ecumenical Patriarchate goes, um, I don't know what that will look like in the future. Um, and right. uh, I just have to wait and see. Like I said, that's something really for the bishops to determine. So if, if you don't possible. mind, maybe I'll chime in on this. That's oh, I'm fine. sorry. Go ahead. No, it is possible to change things because, so for example, St. Nicodemus of Mount Athos in his uh, commentary on the canons of the church talks about um, giving communion differently in times of plague. And uh, so, I mean, that, and of course, and of course, in the, I mean, the spoon is a, uh, ninth century innovation, dare I say that. Uh, prior to that, people received communion in their hands, uh, just as priests still do today, and then drank from the single chalice, or maybe from several chalices that would be open, that would be offered. Um, you know, so so we've distributed communion in a variety of ways over the centuries, 
And uh, I, I would right. argue, maybe, yeah, I would argue that maybe the spoon was given, uh, was was used, um, really to help give communion uh, in large churches in a very quick manner. Um, I mean, so if you can imagine, you have to go and you receive the body of Christ from the priest, and then you have to walk over to the deacon uh, to drink from the chalice. Uh, if you have, you know, if you're in Hagia Sophia and you have 5,000 people in it, uh, that's, you know, <laughs> that's hard to do. Uh, the spoon is much more yeah. quick. Sure. Well, let me chime in just very quickly on this, this question, if you don't mind. And this is for Please. Harriet. And that is in in my particular diocese, in our diocese, our bishop has allowed a temporary, uh, very minor change in the way that we impart communion. Not so much that it's not given by a spoon. However, what we've been permitted to do um, and of course, we still only have a limit, as our state does, of only 10 people at a time. So, for instance, this morning I, I had divine liturgy and I imparted communion. So we, we have uh, about 100 or so metal spoons that we purchased. And these spoons were blessed and they're only used to impart the Eucharist. And so the Eucharist is given in a traditional way, and that is I take one spoon from the tray and I impart communion to the communicant in the traditional way. Then I take that spoon and I set it aside, and then I take a new spoon and I impart communion, et cetera, et cetera. And then oh, you know, all the spoons are, of course. yeah, so that's what we're doing now. He's also permitting... Uh, wooden spoons. However, I personally don't feel entirely comfortable with that, but that is disposable. In other words, you would burn those afterwards. In mm -hmm. the case of the metal spoons, mm -hmm. then what I do is I rinse those, I, I take that water, and I, dis I, I, I place it into the ground where no one walks, and then go ahead and sterilize those spoons again. So, you know, and there's different ways to do that, too. You could use Everclear mm -hmm. and so forth. Getting a little bit too mm -hmm. much in the weeds. But the point is, there's a little bit of flexibility among certain bishops out there. Okay? And there has been historically. All right. Very well. good. A absolutely. I, I agree. I agree. All right. Let's uh, let's remind everybody one eight five five AF radio. That's one eight five five two three seven two three four six. We would love to hear from you uh, about your experience um, on both sides of this particular issue, both delivering some kind of 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 church experience to the parishioners, and from the parishioners' side receiving that church experience online or however you've been doing that. We'd love to hear from you. So, so, um, Alexei, let's go forward to the financial aspect, and we're, we're actually running out of time here, but let's okay. talk about the next section here, and that is the financial sure. impact of coronavirus on Orthodox parishes. What can you tell sure. us that you found? Sure. Uh, so, first of all, I wanted to give a little bit of background. So why we would expect that finances would drop? I see at least three major reasons. Number one, individual church members are losing their jobs. Uh, you know, they are full load. So people just have less money to give. That's that's a very valid reason, okay? Number two, in many parishes, we are not talking about Greek Orthodox parishes, which are better equipped, but I'm talking about smaller Rokor parishes or OCA parishes. There is no really any form of online donations in place. So people are still relate on passing plates. So if you cannot pass plates, you just don't have channels, you know, to get your money on a normal way. And the third aspect why you, you might expect that donations will drop is very simple. We talked about this. People are coming to the church not just because of, uh, you know, worship services, but also socialize. So they're not getting this reward and they are less inclined to feel excited about their parishes so they give less money. So those are three major reasons that we can think about. So in our survey, we asked two questions and we got two news. One was good news, one was bad news. So first, good news. Uh, we asked parishes, uh, how prepared is your church financially to face this crisis if it continues well into the summer? 
So in other words, it's not for one month, it's for another, you know, three, four, five months, whatever. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting, more than three quarters of churches, 78% say either we have sufficient finances to face this crisis without making any changes and we can do this through the summer. Okay, we, we got it covered, right? And then another 30% said, okay, that would be a little bit of a problem, but we can manage easily by reducing some secondary expenses. So the good news is more than three quarters of our parishes say, well, if worse came to worse and this pandemic will go, you know, for another four months, we will do, we will be doing all right. It will be not fun, but we will be doing all right. Now, here is bad news. Our second question was, so far, is giving to your church during this crisis up or down? 50% of parishes say it is down. 46% oh of the parishes say it is it's about the same, and a handful of parishes say it is up. When we followed up mm. with the questions, to those parishes who say it is down, what what percentage it is down? So on average, it is thirty percent. So you got mixed back. The churches will survive, but they definitely feel a rather strong and hard mm -hmm. hit from declining donations. Mm -hmm. That's reality. And we will follow up with a little bit more elaborated questions in our next survey, so that we will get a little bit better, a little bit more precise idea what is going on exactly with finances. Great, great. Father Stephen, I know you had mentioned previously that uh, there may have been a little bit of a financial uh, impact on your parish. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And are you doing anything specifically to address that through outreach, online giving, or or give us some specifics of as much as you can? I, I don't. If you don't feel comfortable talking about it, it's it's understandable. No, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, a couple of things. Obviously, we need to begin uh, very seriously undertaking online giving. Um, I mean, I don't carry a checkbook anymore, and I'm probably listed among the old guys at this point. Uh, so I'm sure most people do not. Um, yes, you do have to pass a plate, and in the absence of that, you have to have online giving available. So we do. Uh, you can light candles online. So, for example, you can submit a prayer request through our website and through our Facebook page, and we will light I candles and pray for the people you've asked for. Uh, go into the church and That's do great. that. Um, I, you know, I have, I, I just, I have an amazing and wonderful staff, an amazing and wonderful parish council, um, and 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 all of these people are just so on the ball, so devoted to Christ, but. Uh, you know, so our stewardship chairman on the parish council uh, sent a letter out to the entire parish uh, just saying that, that, you know, we've assessed things financially. And um, sure. he, he asked, he said, he asked people, if you can accelerate your stewardship commitment for the entire year and pay it in the next month or two or three, which is when we'll be dealing with really the financial impact of this crisis probably most severely, I would think. Um, you know, and he said, I can't ask that of you unless I do it myself. And so I, I commit to you that I'm going to pay my stewardship for the entire year uh, in the next couple of weeks. And he did. And, and so we've had parishioners actually wow. follow his example and, and pay forward their stewardship commitment for the entire year Wonderful. now. Um, and so, I mean, in that sense, we've been very blessed. So, and, and we did apply for uh, the CARES Act, um, and we did receive, I don't think the funds are in the bank yet, but we received approval. Um, and uh, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese itself uh, applied for the CARES Act and is receiving money as a result. Um, our parishes have been encouraged to do that. Um, so throughout this metropolis, at least, of San Francisco, uh, that's been done, and, and we did that early on. And again, so we were granted uh, some funds as well uh, to keep our staff in place. And, and hopefully the government will, in fact, forgive those loans. Um, we'll see what actually happens. But at any rate, um, so I do feel right, like if, right, you, right. Uh, if you emphasize online giving, 
if you challenge people with regards to stewardship. Um, you've, you've done everything that you've needed to do, including apply for loans to the CARES Act, uh, everything that you can do um, to be financially prudent. I think that people will respond to that. I mean, we've, we've cut back on our purchases. We don't purchase anything we don't need at this point. Um, you know, we're, we're watching our finances very carefully. Um, sure, of course. Uh, does that make sense? It was. It makes perfect sense, and it resonates with me uh, and and my parish situation very much, gentlemen. We are basically out of time, so I want to ask you both two questions. But I I want you to, if you can, please keep your answers brief. So we're going to combine two questions here. The first is, what lesson? So give me one lesson that we can learn from this survey. And if you can speculate a little bit, what are what might you see as a long-term implication um, of uh, of the pandemic on Orthodox parishes, if any? What will look different in the future? So, what lesson can we learn from the survey, and what are the long-term implications uh, after this is all done? Alexei, I'm going to start with you, please. Okay. Well. I, I can talk on this matter for a long time, but I will be like like you ask, Father Krieg. Uh, just one, just one, just one. Uh, to me, what came as a great surprise, we Orthodox are not necessarily most proficient denomination, Christian denomination in the United States, uh, which uses all these technologies, you know, online. And it came to me as a great surprise how quickly most of our clergy were able, you know, to bring their... Uh, services online and following up on your second question is sure enough after they learn those technologies and after their parishioners learn those technologies they will keep those technologies you know so to speak running right you know once you learn how to do this mm -hmm. you will keep doing this because you know it, it, it is helpful but here is interesting trick and this is something to think for everyone uh, try to think it that way we have most of our parishes are good parishes or okay parishes where people go over they are happy then we have x number of parishes which are so to speak mediocre parishes people go there but it's not exactly you know they would be happier in another place but it's nearby parish. and then we have relatively few parishes which we can call so to speak outstanding parishes where you have either very charismatic clergyman or he's an outstanding preacher or you have wonderful church choir or chanter so something which may really make these parishes outstanding what mm -hmm. i learned during last pascha during last easter especially you know easter week a number of people actually attended online services not in their home parishes also they also stream but they have found some parishes which offered much better much more engaging experience than their home parishes for example, I have one friend who lives in northeast of the United States. She is part of Greek Orthodox parish. She attended Pascha services in GOA parish, Greek Orthodox parish, somewhere in Florida. And she told me this particular worship service in this Greek Orthodox parish in Florida was attended by 35,000 online viewers. So you have almost like Orthodox megachurch. So wow. what, yeah, what, what might happen? There will be like sort of, forgive me for using this word, but we can see, we might see a trend when people who are not exactly happy with the quality of worship in their local parishes, they will decide, okay, well, you know what? I, I'm much more excited to be online virtual mm. member of this church, which is, you know, thousands and thousands of miles away. And by the way, I also will send my money to, to this parish. Uh, right. I know. Right. I know. We just spoke about the fact that it's not just about online services; it's also about socialization. Sure. Blah blah blah. But nevertheless, I can imagine that there will be X number of people who would say, "Okay, now I can really switch more online my service, and I will be online member of this church, which is thousands of miles away, and this priest will attract thousands and thousands of followers." You know. That's just one speculation. You asked me to keep it short, so I'm, I'm not going any further. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. That, that's actually a pretty shocking insight, Father Stephen. It looks well, like I'm going to have to up my game if that's the case. Uh, Father Stephen, uh, <laughs> right, right, what, right, right. Um, 
<laughs> what um, what lesson did you learn from the survey, and what what things do you see maybe changing or or something that's going to come out of this long term implications from the pandemic? Well, I think a long term uh, implication of the pandemic is that we've had to become much more media savvy as Orthodox Christians than we've ever had to in the past. Uh, every parish has to kind of step up to the plate now. Uh, in ways we didn't have to in the past. Um, so for me, for example, to be honest, um, I've kind of resisted uh, the live streaming of services because I don't think, uh, I mean, the liturgy somehow is not the liturgy. Or, I mean, there's right. no such thing right. in a certain sense as a virtual liturgy. Um, and yet, um, you know, we have shut-ins in our parish. I visit them. I bring them communion on a regular basis. But one lady um, emailed me and said, because the camera's set in such a way that it's right, like, at the front pew, um, she said, I could watch that service, Father, and I cried the whole time because it's like I was actually in church again um, and sitting in the front pew. So I realized at that point, this is a huge ministry for people that, that I've neglected like a fool. And... Um, but also just a question of evangelism. Uh, as Alexei said, um, more people tuned in, I guess I'd say, to our Easter services uh, from all over the place. Um, and, mm -hmm. and questions were emailed. You know, um, sometimes people um, maybe would hesitate to come to a service and maybe would watch it online first in order to feel comfortable and then come to the church or then contact me and ask questions about who are you guys. Um, so this could actually be an evangelism tool as well. But again, the drawback is if it simply becomes a show, that's a problem. Um, and, and again, virtual liturgy cannot ever replace uh, the real thing where we receive the body and blood of Jesus himself. Uh, okay, I'll shut up. I know we're off time. <laughs> <laughs> no, that it was it was really a good answer, and I was uh, while you were speaking, I was nodding my head and having the same feelings. I I know on Pascha we streamed our services, and we never live stream our services, but we streamed it, and we had a nice choir and everything. And I kind of broke down at the end. I I started weeping because I looked at the camera and I said, I miss all of you, and. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah. really honestly did not like it. I didn't feel comfortable. I, you know, it was just sort of, I was out of sorts, but I got so many comments and so many calls. Thank you so much. It was so wonderful. And people yeah. were just grateful yeah. to have that opportunity. So we have to figure out how to get them back into normal <laughs> Orthodox mode, but still serve those who are, are going to be out there. Okay, gentlemen. Alexei Krindach, uh, Father Stephen Siklis, thank you so much. I appreciate your time and your energy and your insight in all of this. I want to remind everybody to visit Alexei's um, uh, new website, orthodoxreality.org, and check out Father Stephen Siklis' uh, uh, Facebook page and website, St. Paul Greek Orthodox Church in Irvine, California. Take a look at his services. Apparently, his Easter service is really something else. Gentlemen, Christ is risen. Thank you so much for joining. Thomas, if, if I can say just one final thing, it's very important. Please go okay. ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I I wanted to talk right now to all clergy, to all Orthodox clergy who are currently listening to us. Please, please help us with the second wave of the survey. So we will be in the field next week. Please complete those surveys. They will be not long ones. They will be about 20 to 25 questions, but we really need your help. We need to hear from everyone. And then when Excellent. we will be doing second wave of Orthodox laity, again, I ask all clergy to help us yeah. by sending those surveys to their respective parishioners. So this is just very, very kind request on my part. Please very help good. Us. Very good. Yeah, the, I think the uh, laity survey will be very, very interesting also. Thank you, gentlemen. Before I give some closing thoughts, I want to thank all our guests for sharing their insights about the response of our parishes during this pandemic. Thanks to Bobby for manning the calls, engineering the program, for our callers, for the tons of people in the chat room. You guys were awesome tonight. Dave D and Ross and Jenny and... Uh, 
Alexandra, and so many people in the chat room. Thank you so much uh, to those who are on Facebook and also YouTube. God bless you. This pandemic is difficult on everyone, and it seems like every aspect of our life has been affected, and this certainly holds true for our beloved parishes. My personal thought here is for all of us to be patient. Pray that our bishops and priests would have insight about the correct next steps to take. Pray that our people would continue to encourage our parishes to reach out in every way possible and Please continue to support them if your income has not been affected with your financial offerings. Stay in touch with fellow parishioners. Help your clergy. Maybe they're not gifted in technical areas. Areas, Give them help and advice. Roll up your sleeves and help. Pray that everyone stays safe as we search for an end to the pandemic and get back to normal life. And that's our show for tonight. Remember to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash ancientfaithtoday. Share out our program after that's posted give us your feedback and contact us with any ideas or topics or guests that you might want to hear about join us next tuesday evening at 9 p.m eastern time 6 p.m pacific time as we talk to father hrach sargassian and we sargsian excuse me and learn about what we know as the Armenian genocide where millions of Armenians and Greek Orthodox Christians perished at the hands of the Ottoman Turks. Christ is risen. Good night, everybody. <laughs>